Yeah, well, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about air service heat pumps. I'm Tom Marasevic. I have a joint position between the Bristol Bay campus, the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, the Cold Climate Housing Critical Center, and the National Renewable Energy Lab. That's why, <laughs> that's why so many logos on this, on this slide. Uh, and I do want to give credit to the two authors of this presentation, uh, Ness Stevens, Robin Garberslot, Tana Danehe, and, and Rob Strong. And they're just great to work with. So I just wanted to uh, make sure I, I mentioned that. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So just a, just a brief outline, a brief intro to air surge pumps. <clears throat> Look at some special considerations for air surge pumps. Um, talk about field evaluation of the performance of air surge pumps that we did here in Alaska. Uh, then talk about a recent lab study that we did at the Cold Climate Housing Research Center. Um, then I want to kind of highlight what kind of savings we can achieve with a system approach when we combine the heat pumps with other energy efficiency measures. Uh, I'm gonna try to draw some conclusions and hopefully we have a little bit of time at the end. I would like to do a live demonstration of a really useful tool, an Alaska heat pump calculator that allows you to estimate how a heat pump is gonna perform in a specific situation. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what is a heat pump? And I think all of us on the, on the same page. So a heat pump is a device that takes heat from a cold place and puts it into a, a warm place. And you, you all probably have, a, have, an, have an experience with, with a heat pump because you all probably have used a refrigerator at some point in your life. And, and a refrigerator is a heat pump. It takes heat from a cold place from the inside of the fridge or think about the freezer. So it takes the heat from the inside of the freezer and puts it to the outside. That's why the coil on the back of your fridge or the back of your freezer is hot because that's where the heat is going because it was extracted from the inside of that fridge or freezer. And now we can use the same device to heat buildings, except we are not extracting the heat from the inside of the freezer. We are extracting the heat from the outside environment. And I know sometimes people are wondering, how is it possible when it's you know, zero degrees Fahrenheit outside how can we extract you know, any heat from that? But just think of that freezer, right? So your freezer, some of them are down at about zero degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what your freezer is doing. It's extracting the heat from that zero degree Fahrenheit environment and putting it to the warm, uh, <coughs> into the warm uh, area in, your, in, in, in the room where the, where the freezer is located. So it is definitely possible. Uh, and so, so here's just a drawing of an air source from an outside unit that's extracting the heat from the outside environment and, and then an inside unit that's supplying the heat into the building. And this has, a, this has the potential to be a, a more efficient way of heating buildings compared to conventional heat sources where we are just creating the heat by combustion. Uh, because here we are mainly transferring the heat as opposed to creating, we are transferring it from the outside to the inside. And I'm critically gonna talk about the air source pumps, the other types like ground source pumps, uh, but I'm going to talk mainly about the air source heat pumps. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what are the advantages of heat pumps? Uh, they are relatively low maintenance. Uh, they have no combustion on site. Uh, they are partially renewable because the heat is in the outside environment, thanks to things like the sun. Um, they can be fully renewable if we provide the electricity for the heat pump from a renewable source. And uh, they have the potential to lower energy use and energy costs because their efficiencies are greater than 100%. Uh, can you go to the next slide? That's why we don't call it an efficiency, actually, we call it the coefficient of performance. Now, how is it possible that it's greater than 100%? It has to do with loss of physics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So, you know, the electrical energy that is supplied to the heat pump, it ends up in the building in the form of heat. Uh, and also the energy that's extracted from the outside ends up in the building in the form of heat. So at the end, you get more heat inside than what you put into the heat pump in the form of electrical energy. Now, how many times more? That's what the coefficient of performance tells you. So if the coefficient of performance is, for example, three, then for every unit of energy, you supply to the heat pump in the form of electricity, you get three units of energy in the form of heat into the building. It's because that one unit of energy you supply in the form of electricity ends up in the building in the form of heat. And the additional two units are the ones extracted from the outside environment and they end up in the building also. 
So you get three for one that you supply to, to the heat pump. Uh, so that's why it's such an interesting technology. That's why nowadays there's a lot of buzz about heat pumps because it's uh, you know it's thought of as one of the major tools to lower our reliance on, on fossil fuels. So yeah, giving you an update of where we are as far as research goes on utilizing the heat pumps in Alaska and all climate uh, areas and in general. Uh, next slide, please. So there is a fundamental challenge to using extra heat pumps, obviously, because the colder it gets outside, the more difficult it is to extract the heat from the cold air. And the capacity of the heat pump goes down. So with lower outside temperature, the heat pump is able to supply less heat. Now, your building envelope does the opposite. The colder it gets, the more heat you need to be supplying to your building. So, so you may end up with a heat deficit. And at some point, you might come to a point where the heat pump stops working altogether. So when you need your heat source the most, it stops working on it. That's not a good thing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that's why we do need a backup heat source in cold climate. So, so it's, it's one of the important considerations for using air heat pumps in very cold climates. Uh, another consideration is, so what is the source of electricity and how efficient it is? If you are in Southeast Alaska uh, with hydroelectric plants, uh, it might make a perfect sense to use heat pumps. If you are in Billingham, for example, uh, where we are producing electricity from diesel generators, then we really need to ask ourselves the question, well, does it make sense to burn diesel in the diesel generator to produce the electricity for the heat pump when we can just take the diesel and burn it directly in the heating source um, for, for the building? Because diesel at the same time in communities like Dillingham is, uh, is frequently used for heating. Uh, and when you kind of do the math, an, an efficient uh, generator, a diesel generator, is say roughly 35% efficient. Um, an efficient all power heating system is say 85% efficient. 85% uh, divided by 35% is about two and a half. So that means we need a coefficient of performance, the COP, at least about two and a half for this to make sense. If the COP is much lower than that, then the diesel we need to burn in the power plant to produce the electricity for the heat pump is a greater amount than if we just, just directly heating with an all power heating system and just burning the diesel directly on site for the heating system. So this is a very important thing to think to analyze when we are deciding where and how we are going to be deploying heat pumps. Other considerations, are you going to use air to air system or air to water system? So that has to how you distribute then the heat inside in your house. Is it you know, a hydronic system like right here in this building? Or is it an air to air system? Here's an example of that, where we are just directly heating the inside air. Uh, if it's air to air, I'm going to use ducted or ductless system. Uh, here, what you see in the picture, it's a ductless system. So the indoor unit is directly heating that space where that unit is, is located, sucking the room temperature air on top, and then it's exhausting the same air, but now it's a, it's a warm air because, because it, got, it got heated. And these are the ones and that are currently getting a lot of attention. So that's the ones we are focusing on in our research. They are often called the, the ductless mini split system. And so that's where a lot of our research goes because there's a huge interest in these heat pumps, partly because they have a relatively low installed cost and partly because they tend to be the ones more, the, the ones the most efficient. So that's where a lot of attention is and that's where a lot of the research is going. Uh, and then, of course, another consideration uh, was the outside, outside air cutoff temperature. If you want to use it in very cold climates, we want to know how low can it operate. Uh, next slide, please. So we did a, a field evaluation of performance of SOT pumps uh, in 2014 to 2015. Here on this map, uh, the communities uh, where we did the studies and the ones with the orange, orange uh, squares are the ones where we evaluate the heat pumps in a greater detail than the other ones. So it's in Dillingham, in Juneau, and in Wrangell. And, and I have the results for that on the next slide, please. Thank you. So, so here are the results from that field evaluation. On the x-axis, that's the outside temperature. And on the y-axis, 
that's the coefficient of performance. And we are looking both at the steady state coefficient of performance and the integrated coefficient of performance. And I can explain the difference between those two on this, this series that has the black and blue dots. I'll use the mouse just so people online can see my pointer at the same time. Thank you. So, so when you when you look at like the temperature, say you know, for 40 degrees Fahrenheit and going to say you know, 45 degrees Fahrenheit. The black series and the blue series are basically sitting on top of each other. And that's where the steady state performance is the same as the integrated performance because the heat pump runs in a steady state. Then when you go to the colder temperature, what starts happening, the integrated performance, that's the black series, is lower than the steady state performance, which is the blue series. And the reason for that is when you get to these colder temperatures, there is frost that's building up on the outside coil because your temperatures are below freezing. And remember, the coil needs to be colder than the outside environment. So you know, even when I'm at say, you know, say, say 36 degrees Fahrenheit outside, uh, the coil is likely below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so you are developing ice, even though the outside temperature is not that freezing yet. And, and so what the heat pump has to do every so often, it needs to go through a defrost. So, so it's cyclos, it no longer operates in a steady state, and the cycling is what can potentially significantly lower the performance. So that's why, that's why the black series is the integrated coefficient of performance is lower than the, than the steady state coefficient of performance. Now what happens when you get into warmer temperatures is that there is not much heat demand, uh, and all of a sudden, the heat pump, even in the lowest compressor speed, the compressor, that's how it regulates this amount of heat it's supplying, even the, in the lowest one, it's too much heat for the building. And the only one the heat pump's being regulated is through cycling. So it turns on, it turns off, it turns on, it turns off. And that, again, lowers the integrated performance. That's why the black series is below the, the blue series. So we study both the steady state coefficient of performance and the integrated coefficient of performance. Now I remember the magic number was COP of two and a half. So you know, if I draw a line here, COP of two and a half, you can see that in some situations, the heat pump is a pretty amazing tool. It just can, it can save a lot of energy. Now in some other situations, like, like down here, we are way below the COP of two and a half. And in fact, we are, we are wasting diesel in this, in this situation. So from this, we can learn that the heat pumps do have a potential to, to save a lot of energy if we use them in a preferred situation and we use them in appropriate ways. And, and that's, really, that's really important because if we just start deploying heat pumps everywhere, uh, we might be doing the opposite. So, so we do want to understand how to use them appropriately and, and, and what are the appropriate uh, applications for that. This, this red and green series uh, is, is a heat pump in Wrangler. Uh, and kind of anecdotal, it wasn't, it wasn't the intent of the research, but we are noticing that with lower thermal loading, which also means with the lower compressor speed, you are getting significantly higher coefficient of performance for that heat pump. Now with this, this purple and blue series, it's actually a heat pump here in Dillingham. We were noticing the opposite, that, that with the lower thermal loading, the performance went down. Actually. And it created a very important research question because we want to understand if we want to be correctly deploying heat pumps, we want to understand uh, how to be sizing them. Also, you know, should we do a nighttime setback on that very low the temperature at night or not? And all that depends on the understanding of how the efficiency changes with the different levels of thermal loading. And this actually triggered the, give the next slide, please. Uh, this triggered the, the lab study that I'm gonna talk about in just a little bit, but kind of the, the main conclusions from, uh, from this field monitoring. So, so we learned that, that the transient operation where the pump cycles can significantly lower uh, the performance. So focusing on optimizing things like the different cycles uh, is a very important topic. Also, there are large variations among the individual models. Uh, next slide, please. So, so going to the lab study that, uh, that we, we, just, we just completed, uh, the main focus uh, was to evaluate how the performance changes with different levels of thermal loading. It, uh, this is a cold chamber at the Cold Climate Housing Research Center in Fairbanks. 
Uh, you can see the outdoor unit installed inside. Um, the cold chamber, it can go down to floor below. Um, and the indoor unit just playing the heat in the environment of the lab where it's located. Um, next slide, please. And so here are the results from this study. And, and we just published this in Journal of Sustainability. So if any of you wants to uh, learn more details, just uh, you can look up this study uh, in the Journal of Sustainability. Uh, but, but what we found, uh, which was to some extent a little unexpected, uh, is that so with the looking at the first graph, and again, where is the mouse here? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So people online can, can see that. Uh, so on the x axis, that's the thermal loading 100% means it's fully loaded, is the max it can provide. On the y axis, the coefficient of performance and studying it at different temperatures. Uh, but the, the trend is the same. Uh, what we found is that once you start decreasing the level of thermal loading from the maximum capacity, the coefficient of performance goes up. And this is, we, we study four different models and, and these are all of, all of our models combined. Uh, so so the, the coefficient of performance starts going up and we thought it would just continue going up, but it was a little surprised it did not. At a certain point it maxes out. And then when you're further decreasing the thermal loading, uh, the coefficient of performance is, is going down. And so decreasing thermal loading, just imagine, say, you have a more insulated building. So you're in the same situation, but then more insulated building, so the building needs less heat than you know, the building that would be, be less insulated. So, uh, so that's, that's what the thermal loading means. Or the way you can look at it is, should we buy, be buying oversized heat pumps that are meant for a much larger building uh, that has a much higher heat demand and using it for this building that's a lower heat demand? So, so that's where that's what the thermal loading the thermal loading refers to. So this is unfortunately like curve that didn't lead to any immediate conclusions. So from this, we cannot say we should be oversizing or undersizing heat pumps because of the shape of the curve. This this the shape of the curves is we need the heat pump just right. Uh, but if you want to just try, uh, this is this is a study from a lab, a steady state coefficient of performance. We want to do some calculations that would it just right. Really, we need a field performance in the same curves, but we need the field, the field uh, performance, the integrated performance, which we haven't done yet. We have done the standard field, but we haven't studied how the COP changes with different levels of thermal loading. Then we did a study in the lab. We, we studied how it changes with different levels of thermal loading, but it's still bad. So now our next step is to combine these two and do another study and study in the field how the coefficient of performance changes with different levels of thermal loading. So, uh, so I'm hoping to study this this coming winter. Uh, this next graph here is it's very similar data. I just pulled it differently, where the x-axis is the temperature and the y-axis is the coefficient of performance. As you can see, it you know, with lower temperatures, the COP goes down. And for each we plotted the COP for the maximum thermal loading, and also the thermal loading that's close to the highest efficiency. So that kind of refers to the peak here on, on, this, on this curve. Uh, next slide, please. When talking about using heat pump, I think it's important to mention there are other things we can, we can do to save energy because the biggest savings are with a system approach. So when we combine the heat pump with other energy efficiency measures, that's where we can get the highest savings. So here's just an example. This is, a, this is a home in Billingham, uh, extremely efficient home. You can see the very, very thick walls. It is 28 inches thick walls. It's, it's an extremely high building uh, and uh, it's, it's heated with an air source heat pump. Uh, the heating bill is at $200 annually for, for this building and a small fraction of what a typical building in Billingham is. And, uh, and, and again, this is largely because of uh, the other energy efficiency measures like the super insulated uh, construction. Um, next slide, please. So the main conclusions, uh, we, know, we know that the air source heat pumps can significantly reduce energy use and energy costs if we, if we use them right. Uh, now how to use them right, we don't know exactly. We are closer to knowing, uh, but there's more research to, to be done. Um, so we know that not only the outside temperature, but also the level of thermal loading is an important factor. Um, we do need more research, and I already mentioned where we are heading uh, with that. And uh, and system approach yields uh, biggest savings. Um, next slide, please. Lots of people and entities help with these projects. Big thank yous. We couldn't have done it without oh, them. Next slide, please. Yes, so we can get a hold of me or or, or the co-authors of this presentation. 
And um, do we have time for the demonstration? Uh, I think we're running a little bit behind anyway, so might as well. Okay. <laughs> 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 Tom, could I ask a question? Yeah. Wouldn't your, your CLP be enhanced if you were to reuse, say, yeah. or just the itself? I mean, was that, or would the capital costs of building something like that outweigh whatever performance potentials you might achieve? So, so that's a great question. Yes. I think my grounds would be pumped, right? Uh, especially if the is is probably below the outside air, you know, the ground. You only add, you know, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, for example. So, so, lower, so, so the COP oh, is much yeah. greater, but the capital cost is also much that's greater. Yeah. Than yeah. The and this is the reason that the most attention is being currently put to the air surging pumps, especially the Douglas Ministers in Alaska, because of the very low capital cost relatively compared to the other uh, if you put like a solar tube heating right next to the heat pump outside air, if you have a little bit of heat comes from a solar tube heat pump. Again, solar economics. Tube. Yes, yes, so, economics. The reason you don't do it much is because it's because there are often better places we can put the money to save energy. Uh, but you're right. In principle, it is something that would enhance the efficiency. Is it just the best place to put our resources? So that's that's the question. But it would be a great project to analyze. Yeah, thank you. I, should we wait with questions or? Yeah. Yeah. Can I maybe just so mess around quickly through this? Thank you. So this is a really useful tool developed by by Alan Mitchell with ML analysis. Nor um, we helped with with this calculator. Uh, there's a lot we don't know about the performance of Econ Alaska. But he did just an amazing job compiling what we do know and, and giving the best estimate we can. And, and so, uh, so it's uh, heat pump dot CF. And, and uh, it's a really practical tool. If you want to see is heat pump going work for you, I would strongly recommend this tool. And I just want to give you a quick intro to that. Um, it has uh, default values, and we are out of time. I just want to use the default values here mostly. Uh, but I want to. Uh, let's just as well use building him right when when uh, we are in building him right now. So let's see how would a heat pump, a ductless municipal heat pump, work in in Dillingham. So let's use Dillingham here, and it has it's only pulling data from the database. So I'm going to choose residential from the Shugate Cop local utility here. It has uh, um, it might this time not be the most recent values, but I think they are still fairly representative values. I'm just going to go with them. You can override them if you want, you know, spread the cost per kilowatt hour and such. Uh, we do need to choose the size of the building. You guys choose. What size of the building would you like? 40 by 40. <laughs> okay, 1,600 square feet. Let's go with that. <laughs> so, so 1,600 square feet. And I'll go to the default snow garage, two by six construction. Let's assume it's heated with, with oil, as many buildings in Dillingham are. Uh, $5.32 per gallon. Again, maybe not the latest. I'm just going to go with that. Um, I think uh, um, for demonstration, the tool is sufficient. Uh, and you know how to go back and, and put in more accurate, accurate values. Uh, standard efficiency, hydronic system. Um, I can leave this this out. Uh, if you do know your usage, you put it in to calibrate the model better. If you don't, it's okay. The model can do that. Um, you electricity usage, um, thermostat set point seventy degrees Fahrenheit, single zone heat pump, install cost estimated at five thousand dollars. Assuming no rebates, assuming no financing. Assuming you use it down to five degrees Fahrenheit and below that point, you keep it off because as you saw in the graph, it doesn't make much sense to use it in very cold temperatures because you would be wasting diesel. Uh, the efficiency is low and the power plant needs to burn a lot of diesel to provide the electricity for heat pump. So uh, we'll keep it that way. Some, some additional options about how we are using uh, the heat pump. 
Um, now, um, <clears throat> we let's assume it's a building that has more zones than, than just one. Uh, let's say 46% is exposed to where the heat pump is going to be located. You accept room temperature and bedrooms cooler, which means some of the heat from the main area heating can go into those bedrooms. Um, we have a 6% tail cell tax, cell tax in Dillingham, and let's calculate the results. And rate of return, negative, not too negative, but a little negative. Uh, the net present value tells you a similar thing, um, negative. Um, you are saving a bunch of oil. You are using a lot of extra electricity. COP is about 2.6, so kind of at that break even point, like, like I talked about. Uh, greenhouse mm -hmm. gas emission saving roughly half a ton. Um, not very much, but saving, saving a little bit. And uh, results uh, by month, uh, not shown it in this case. Uh, but the this is this is expected. So we are close to breaking even. And the reason we are close to breaking even is that we are replacing burning diesel in the building with burning diesel in the power plant to produce the electricity for the building. So that's why I'm roughly breaking even. There are things we could do to make this for a little more efficiently. We could probably be turning off the heat pump not at five degrees Fahrenheit, but say at 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So, because in the cold periods, that's when that's when you are really wasting the diesel because the efficiency goes down. So we could, but we would still be hovering around the break-even point. Now, there's the current situation in Dillingham. Uh, as we are exploring renewable energy options for Dillingham, the situation can be very, very different. Uh, like uh, what Kenny is going to talk about the Niagara Hydro uh, this afternoon, for example. I look forward to that presentation. So, does this mean these results should be forget about heat pumps in Dillingham? The answer is no. Uh, there are some situations where they can make a little bit of sense, uh, but with respect to the future, I think it's a very important option to keep in mind because because if we are able to provide a substantial amount of our energy from renewable sources, then this changes the equation entirely. So all of, all of a sudden, instead of burning diesel, you are using renewable energy to heat your to heat your buildings. So um, so that's where. That's what Berlin might end. Uh, so let's look at the pumps in mind for future utilization. So utilization, so let's study the performance so we can more accurately model uh, what kind of advantages they are going to bring us. So, uh, Meg, I know you had a question. Sorry, I didn't wait so long. Well, that's what I was wondering about in terms of you mentioned earlier in terms of the facility limit and the state overall. But as you're looking at thermal loading, I'm wondering if anyone else is studying. Um, Utilizing solar versus wind versus hydro. Um, I think those are fairly separate questions. Uh, when we talk about grid ties, the grid tie systems, they are fairly separate questions. They are a little bit, little bit of connection, uh, but but fairly separate. And the Alaska Center for Energy Power, and we have multiple people here, is doing a lot of research on on those options. Thank you. Yeah, well, we went through that, those numbers in class. You could drop that kilowatt hour use if you had your own solar battery system to run that heat pump. That was a lot better. Definitely. But once you have solar, the question is does it make better sense to just feed into the grid and use it where it's needed? Or does it make sense to install a heat pump and all of a sudden you are running more diesel when the heat pump is there versus when you just have the solar? Uh, so then the question is, you know, once you put the solar, does it still make sense to let the heat pump to it or not? So, uh, so that's still, still a question to be answered. And we have a tool here that helps us answer the question. And we are doing more research to, to be able to make more accurate predictions. But again, uh, with, you know, this is the current situation. I think the big picture is, yes, it can make a lot of sense uh, as we are moving towards renewable energy. So let's definitely, you know, look at and analyze um, uh, the uh, this in, in a holistic way, and let's try to create uh, you know the best situation we can for the future. And the heat pumps uh, seem to be an important part of that. So I think I should stop here. Thanks right. for the time. <laughs> <laughs>
Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Weber. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about BDRCCD. I want to introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm originally from the Copper River and Prince William Sound area. I grew up in Cordova. Um, this will be my fourth season fishing in the Green Bay. Uh, a handful of years ago, I fell in love with the Bristol Bay fishermen. Now I fish over here. So I was uh, <laughs> born and fishing in Southwest. I'm here to talk to you guys about BBRCTE, which I'm pretty sure takes the cake for the longest acronym in the Bay. Six. <laughs> <laughs> but it's for Bristol Bay region, which should all start with that. Career and technical education. So the CTE program is new to this region, relatively new. Um, years ago, one school district, I believe it started with Lake Peninsula School District, took CTE on and it has since expanded to the whole region. So like Annie mentioned, we've served Dillingham City Schools, Southwest Region School District, Lake Peninsula School District, Lake Clark, Lake Ileana, all the way down to Perryville, and then uh, Bristol Bay School, School District over in Napanake and Kingston. Um, go ahead. So at, a, at BBRCTE, I just want to give a, a, a very brief um, telling of what we do, and we basically fly students in from the region to our hub communities and have these things called intensive weeks. So we fly students in and we try to get them licensed or certified or um, dual, dual credit opportunities for classes um, that we find are culturally and economically relevant to our region. Um, so my passion project, my focus has been on the fisheries. That was a pathway that hadn't really been um, tapped into from BBRCTE yet. And so I'm taking off my focus on the fisheries pathway. And the mission of the fisheries pathway is to validate commercial fishing as a viable career option by supporting students with opportunities and first and foremost, subsistence opportunities, because that's the foundation of this entire pathway. Um, splitting into three branches, which is fishery science, fishery leadership, and commercial entry. Um, so there's three main takeaway points uh, that I'd like to share. And these points are really targeted at our school districts. A lot of times folks that work in our school districts aren't actually from the region. So it takes a little bit of convincing on why um, commercial fishing is an important and validated career option. And that first point is that commercial fishing builds on subsistence knowledge with an economic purpose. So those who are raised in subsistence fishing already have the foundation required for commercial fishing knowledge and skills. So from an institution standpoint, you can think of it as a prerequisite for this career. It's one of our few traditions that really translates into potentially large financial earnings as we've seen in Bristol Bay Run for the last few years. Uh, my second point is that commercial fishing on your home waters further develops the stewardship relations you have with the land and sea. It's pretty hard to be out there in the bay and not feel connected to the water. So watershed residents who commercial fish also understand that profiting off of the watershed means the first prioritize ecological health. So I, uh, pub line. <laughs> uh, financial profit is a direct result of ecosystem stewardship. Indigenous people and residents care about the long-term health of Bristol Bay. So it's a cultural and financial investment. And then my third point is that the financial security of Bristol Bay's economy relies on permits staying in region, not just Alaskan residents and definitely not permits that have migrated out of state, but permits in our region. So if these permits continue to migrate out of region as they have since the introduction of limited entry, our communities will lose our primary economic import. Um, even in-state residents, Take their money and they do take them back to their home communities, which is awesome. But as we know, we need our money to stay in Dillingham, we need to stay in the villages as well. So, we really want to empower our regional people to buy back into their home fishery. So, the overarching goal is really permit acquisition and retention. And just to summarize, um, we're building on subsistence knowledge with an economic purpose, we're developing our stewardship relationship we have with the land and sea. And the financial of Bristol Bay's economy relies on permits in region. So to quickly talk about um, what we've been doing this year and then eventually what we'll be doing next year. Um, the last few years, actually, we've had a set net camp down at Pilot Point in the fishing district of Ngatchik. Um, we fly students down to Pilot Point where they're in the camp of the incredible Katie Birch. Some of you may know her. I feel like she's in Alaska now. She lives in Homer. She's been fishing there for 35 years. And she takes students down and uh, really gives them an introduction to the fishery. So for students who maybe their families have since sold their permits and they don't have this um, connection with fishing anymore, 
Um, this is to kind of rebuild that knowledge that's been potentially lost in their family. Um, so they learn how to tie knots, they learn how to talk on the radio, they go out there and catch fish. With our education permit we have, they deliver to the tender, they also practice subsistence fishing, um, mending nets, building nets, all of that. So we're getting ready to do that again this year. We've got nine kids going, so we're pretty excited about that. Commercial fishing for credit is really targeted at our school districts to validate that commercial fishing is education. It's one of the most well-rounded educations you could ever receive. Um, you learn so much from leadership, safety, um, how to cook for people, how to care for people, how to care for yourself, and how to really push yourself. So commercial fishing for credit, if a student goes out set netting, drifting, or even seining, because some of our students sane um, down on the Alaska Peninsula, then those students and they are signed off by the captain on 10 of these 20 proficiencies, then they receive one high school credit. That's the equivalent of a year's worth of credit. So it's a lot of credit, and that's the amount of credit hours that those students would be working. So really validating this as education. Um, the fish tech course we're doing with ADF and G, we did it last year as a trial run, and it went amazingly. We did it here in Dillingham with our uh, area manage by management biologist, Tim Sands, and the assistant biologist, Phil Stacy. And we flew students into town. I think we had 12 of them. Um, and we had them get CPR and first aid certified over at the fire hall. Um, they got a crash course on what it's like to work for fishing game from Tim. Um, they filled out employment paperwork. They kind of got this well-rounded uh, department introduction. And then we took them out to Wood River, where they erected the fish counting tower. They beach tank. They took ASL samples. Um, and they essentially got totally trained up for this position. And now they're hireable. So we hope that when they turn 18, they have this option. ADF and G wants to hire them. We want local kids. Um, so that was a great course. We also had a lot of inter uh, interest for internships, expanding on that. So that's something that we might work to see anymore. I know BDEDC has done internships with uh, fishing games, so we can work on their platform and getting more youth involved in the department. And also working on that relationship that local people can have. In some places in Alaska, that's a rocky relationship. We're kind of distinct and separate. So we really want to work on these fishermen biologist relationships. Um, and then we did take students um, to the Bristol Bay Board of Fish meeting and the Alaska Peninsula Board of Fish meeting. Um, both of those were an incredible experience. Students uh, met with biologists, advisory committee coordinators. Um, we, we took part in the crash course that Tavin has put on um, with the director of Board of Fish. Um, we brought students to the meeting, they listened, they wrote follow-up papers, they got high school credit for it. Um, incredible opportunity, a lot happened at this meeting with you guys following. Uh, and we look forward to doing those in the future. Next year, um, we plan on also having the SetNet camp again. At Pilot Point, we will continue to always do commercial fishing for credit. We're going to do the fish tech course again. And this year, we never really got this subsistence value integrated into a course. And so this fall, I'll be working closely with Annie and other people in the community to have a smoke fish class and a traditional three. So while we um, do the traditional three-day smoke with the instruction of elders and community members, um, we're also going to process um, other traditional foods. It'll be right at the tail end of the new season. So hopefully we'll get some tongue and heart in there. Salmon will still be swimming. It would be great if we could go catch a few stragglers um, with a subsistence net. Um, and make some fish head soup, make all sorts of traditional foods, have a big potluck at the end. So I'm really excited for that. We'll invite our fish tech students that will be coming in from Wood River. We'll give them a big feast and um, we're excited for that one. That one is also going to receive college credit through UAS um, along a culinary pathway. Um, our fishery services class, we're actually working closely with um, Tav and Gabe on this right now. Um, we just the other day in a meeting turned it from a one week long class. We're just like, we don't know how we can cram this in one week. Let's do it two weeks. So we'll have two intensive weeks um, next spring where we'll have, do you kind of have them narrowed out? Can you say the list? Because basically, like, <laughs> marine, we're, we're, we're figuring out how we'll lay out the weeks. It'll be like marine hydraulics, um, outboard maintenance, refrigeration, RSW. It's not like a maintenance class. Um, a boat maintenance class with the crash course on all these different um, operations. Um, we're also going to incorporate each of those two weeks of focus on the business of fishing, 
Um, obviously, we know that's really an important part for efficient to be successful. Then also incorporate BBE into these programs because our students need to know um, they need to know about BBE um, their permit acquisition program, their vessel acquisition program. The people in this region have so many opportunities at their fingertips, and the youth just might not know about it. So the sooner we can start integrating this knowledge into our high schoolers, the stronger workforce we'll have. Um, we'll also take students to the Alaska Young Fishermen Summit. Um, which I'm excited about that. I've never been, so I can't wait to take students there. Um, and I also want to take students down to the boat show. I think just that exposure alone is a very valuable ex uh, experience for our villagers. And, um, and I really want them to be pursuing on the stage. They have Sam Week down in Seattle now. So it's a year something. Restaurants are all serving Bristol Bay salmon. And they can go get re inspired by their home fishery from the outside looking in. So I'm excited about that. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you guys. And we might be short on time. Do you want to do Any questions? I'm going to be able to give it up. This is awesome. Is, um, are you, do you have any thoughts or instruction about um, encouraging people to set up their own markets to make it into the fishery? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that applies to some fisheries more than others. Um, some people do it and do it well and successfully in Bristol Bay, although it's not as common as say the Copper River. Um, that being because this is a um, there's a lot of fish to be caught in a short period of time. If you were to direct process your own fish on a run day to day, you might miss out on the potential earnings you could if you just delivered to the tenders. That said, there are some families who do it successfully well, and I think. Um, as this fishery might be taking potentially a little bit of a downturn, as all fisheries do, this roller coaster effect, it might be more beneficial for some to start looking at direct marketing. Um, and I know there's a lot of incentives and programs around the state on teaching this marketing. Um, so I'll be looking into that one. Just to plug Stephen for that, we have a pamphlet, a booklet with several pages about becoming a direct marketer and the licensing requirements and food requirements and everything. Also, we do direct marketing classes. Any other questions? Is this moving into marketing our salmon oil and capsulizing our salmon oil and also extracting the collagen and marketing that to the world too? And how that plays into better marketing our salmon to the planet? Yeah, I know we have salmon oil plants in the sound. I don't know about here. Not here, but there are around Alaska. I think that might, yeah, I think I think for like scrap material that doesn't get sold, I think you could. Probably we could be squeezing more on our resources. That's a good question for uh, for the processors. 